um, as a follow look for YouTube, join my buddy Patrick McCray, author of the Dark Shadows Day book, the Dark Shadows Day book about everybody, Gordon Damowski. We're here to talk episode 701, chosen by Gordon Damowski. Uh, this episode is narrated by Thera David, it's written by Sam Hall, and it's directed by Henry Kaplan. So, this episode leads into Barnabas going back, you know, actually goes back into 1897. So, Gordon. What's the one thing this episode to you that stands out the most? It introduces Quentin Collins. Yeah. Intellectual badass. Yeah. We have waited to hear him speak for a long time. And uh, it finally pays off. And it pays off, you know, gangbusters. You know, David Selby likes to tell the story about being worried that it was going to be like the silent movie days and all of that. And no. No, not at all. Uh, he's he's fantastic. Yeah, he just walks in with, he's arrogant, he's confident, he's charming, he's he's you know he's he's trying to get Edith to to, to turn over the will, and of course Sa- Sandor and Magda. That's that that's another thing you gotta credit this this episode for. Absolutely, I really like the. The costume designs in 1897 and how they look. Even Sandor, I love how he's dressed. I love the fake little mustache. <laughs> and Grayson Hall looks amazing. I love her in that long black you know, wig and the makeup, the dress. They, the old house looks very interesting with the little setup they have in the drawing room. You can tell the gypsies don't have a lot of money, and they even mentioned money in this episode, how they want to they'll leave with jewels. Um, Sandor actually runs into Quentin on this episode, which is interesting. I like that. What did you guys think of Edith Collins here? You know, Quentin's reaction, Quentin's interaction with Edith. I like how she plays it being asleep. That's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I also like how she kind of, um, you could, like, she kind of knows that people are using her because, like, she does the whole thing with the tarot card to uh, Quentin. So it's like you get the sense that, yeah, she knows that, like, uh, Magda's using her, and she's she's just countering uh, Quentin at every turn with when he's trying to, to turn on the charm. I like how... They would sell be really... Uh, I, again, the writers deserve credit too, but I think David Selby really makes Quentin work in every way because we've been built up to this ghost that doesn't talk, this menacing figure, right? And I feel once you get this flamboyant, flamboyant sort of sex symbol charm character, it it's a whole different turn on its head, really. And I think that's why another reason why this character works so well, the way Selby played this character of, wait, it, is this guy really that evil? He doesn't seem to be. Well, he's, he's, he may not be glowering, stare down, kill kids evil, but right. it is clear that this guy is a, that he plays Quentin Collins like a total bastard. I mean, this is a guy who, Basically, he 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 cuts uh, Beth short by saying, "Oh, yeah, you know your mistress in the house, Jenny Collins. You remember Jenny, don't you?" He's trying to weasel his way into the will. He is, you know, I think barely tolerant of it. I mean, he puts on this jovial face, but this is, if you look at this in parallel to the Barnabas introduction, Barnabas comes in and he's charming. Um, and he cares about what the family thinks, but he's still a vampire. We know he's still, at this point, a bad dude. You know, we don't think he's a bad dude. It's how Fred plays it. Quentin, um, Selby plays Quentin like, okay, yeah, he's got the charm, but he's a bad dude. Like, this is a guy who is unrepentant. You could see a few steps between Quentin Collins 1897 and the ghost of Quentin Collins and, and the malevolence there. It's not evil, angry, glowering. It's that kind of, yes, I know I'm the black sheep. I know I'm going to spend every penny. Screw you. I'm me. 
But don't you just hope that maybe there's a part of him that really wouldn't spend all that money and would be a good guy? I mean, I, I really, I, I find myself rooting for him despite the fact that I know I shouldn't. Well, I think too, it's that charm. I mean, you, you know, he's going to be a bad guy, but you, you know, like there's that, that, that sense of maybe there is something redeemable in him. You know what I mean? He's not just, he's, he's not Jason McGuire. I mean, no. what's interesting about this episode is if you took out the, the, the Barnabas stuff, you know, both the, the preface with the I Ching and the, 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 the shots of Frid in the coffin, this could easily be a, a pilot for a spinoff series. Oh, uh, you know, and I often think of this as Dark Shadows sort of spinoff series. Mm-hmm. You know, very much so. It's uh, it it is it's it's Dark Shadows does Dark Shadows. Yeah, as as I've said, this is what happens when you're finally confident about what you're doing, and basically, 1897 is going to be a more rascally. Uh, is going to be a more rascally version of 1897 in a lot of ways. What did you guys think of Beth here being introduced? Very, very, very beautiful servant. And obviously, Quentin has a way with women. Beth tells him, uh, Quentin asks to see Jameson. Beth tells him he's sleeping. Beth asks to see Edith. Um, and he he even says you know maybe long he wants to charm her long enough to get in her good uh, good graces. So he's he just seems again. This is when I think of the ghost and I think of the way Selby played Quentin. I can only think of one other character in wrestling that I look at this way. Okay, okay. Post again post rockers. Uh, Shawn Michaels because Shawn Michaels was the heartbreak kid he was the showstopper the main event he was sort of this sex symbol who you wanted to see lose he was very arrogant and flamboyant he wore hearts on his goddamn tights <laughs> his theme song says it all and as have we all at times Joel I mean you know you, you, we've both done that that doesn't make us bad people yeah, but really, I don't see bad in Quentin. I don't see this. I don't see the ghost, is what I'm saying, that we were introduced to. Only in look. And I think once the, the most evil I see Quentin in this entire arc, before Patofe, before we get the werewolf change, really, is the way he treats women is, again, it, he's. He's very rough with them when he's not gentle with them. And when he points a sword, when he, you know, looks like he's going to kill Barnabas, I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's, it's going to go good. But other than that, I don't see this, how do I put this? I don't see this vicious heel. Okay, I mean, yeah, I, uh, uh, I think Gordon, you you might have the more caustic take on him. I you know, I see him as an opportunist. You know, he's out for himself. But we don't know what experiences he's had in the house either. I mean, it it has. Right. Well, I'm 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 talking about him in isolation with this episode because, like, okay. we all see him throughout. Like we see his growth throughout the series, but I'm looking at it in this con in this specific episode context. Sure. I think that too, like with with David Selby's Quentin in this episode, in this specific episode, just to narrow it down. Again, we're built up to a ghost who is you know going to kill kids, and I don't even just in this one episode, I see a guy who wants to get what he wants to get out of the family, but I also think secretly too deep down as as conceited as quentin is he also knows they're just not going to give it to him either <laughs> he again no he i think he, he, he's, he he's, knows he's the black on, sheep of the family he's he's banking on maybe being in the house 15 minutes you know i it's it's just a matter of time until he's shown the door 
I think. He's, I love, I love Edith to just, <laughs> she wants to speak to, Ma like, the fact that she wants to speak to Magda, too. <laughs> Great. She can't give spiritual advice in a vacuum, Jewel. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta, you gotta look at it this way, too. Like, here's this woman who who's on her deathbed, and she's wanting to talk to the gypsy. <laughs> Well, now, Jewel, you know this is as opposed to the to the to the the guy in the collar with the white van and the Snickers bars who wants to talk about how a talking snake was real. I mean, you know, we we we. Anytime you're dealing with mysticism, you're automatically kind of on shaky ground. It becomes a little relative, uh, you know. I, in my humble opinion. Yeah, plus don't forget Sanders elixir, you know. Um you know, Edith likes to, you know, Edith has has a bit of a, you know, she likes to chug it, you know. Um Yes. In fact, Sanders elixir it was later it was later found that that it was actually the the um the main ingredient in Everclear. So just just putting it out there. Could Malort have any uh, any relation with Xandor's elixir? I uh, no. Okay, good, good. I like I how feel, they, I feel uh, better uh, about it. Now. There, David's uh, Sandor is throwing knives at the wall here. Like it's, it's... well, it also is a it, it, it's a great explanation of why the old house, which has been built since the 1700s, is actually relatively intact it when when Barnabas first comes out of his coffin. I mean, I'm sure Barnabas was looking and go, okay, there's the picture of Josette. Oh wait, what are these knife 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 what are these like knife scars in the wall? And then oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Barnabas was thrilled. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, it's he then finds out once he's there, you know, it's um I'm sure as soon as as Sandra becomes his thrall, he's like, no you're going to fix those. You're going to fix those. I'm going to go back in my coffin. And in 1966, they better be clean. I Can you blame him? No, I don't blame him. Oh, really good. By the way, guys, I want you to know before I ask the next question. I've seen the ninth configuration. Good movie. Um, <laughs> when are we talking about that then? <laughs> Uh, whenever you'd like. Uh, uh, have, Gordon, have you seen Ninth Configuration? No, I have not. It's oh, okay. man. It's a doozy. It's a really good movie. Uh, but with this episode, I really like all of the, the new characters we're getting. We get Beth. We get the introduction of Beth. We get the introduction of, of a talking Quentin, finally. Um and I love David Selby's mutton chops here. I love the way they have the sideburns look. They look great on David. Uh, it is a case where I think, you know, uh, the the fake ones really do look a lot more fun. They're a lot more interesting than, you know, what we later get. Um, I mean, I understand, you know, why Mr. Selby wanted to you know, grow real ones and, and deal with that. But these are a hell of a lot more theatrical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do you think like if they just stay in in eighteen ninety seven that we get a thicker like we don't exactly get those mutton chops where we get as thick as possible like the long beard looking? Had we stayed back then? Yeah. So are you talking about some Chester Arthur's going on there? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it's every child's dream. I don't know if it'll happen, but I think it should, and I think you're right for uh, you're right for longing for it. Yeah, and remember, kids, Chester Arthur is slang for heroin. It's just slang for heroin, if only. I think it would have been cool, like, because I'm I'm with you. I get David Selby wanting to grow real ones, and he does eventually in this arc. But and I think if he's if we're given even more time in 1897, not that we don't spend a lot here. I think if, like, they continue in 1897 with, with 
how to do the story with whatever story they're going to do. And Quentin's around and he has to continue to grow out the sideburns. We get longer, more thicker sideburns, which would have been cool. It, it would have been. Now, you, you realize he's not ordered by the court to, to wear them. I mean, you know, he can, sure. he can shave them whenever he wants or have them waxed or lasered or, you know, whatever approach he, you know. It's a very personal thing. I, you know, I'm Gordon and I both have our preferences, Jewel. I'm sure you do too. But, uh, but that's well, neither here nor there. That's not what we're here to talk about is your body grooming, Jewel. And I don't know why you insist on bringing it up again and again and again, but here we are. So, what more do we need to know about it? Yeah. Or, or conversely, um, David Selby could have, as he's growing his sideburns, start wearing white jumpsuits, and then just in the middle of an episode, break into a rendition of Suspicious Minds just for the hell of it. Wouldn't that have been great? You know, uh, had Elvis started to wear the... I think he had started to wear the superhero suit by this point. Yeah, 1968, the big comeback. And I wanted to move away from from, jo- from Jules usual body grooming conversation because I am just tired of that. Every single time we... We get on this podcast. It's it's I, I I you know I'm here for dark shadows. I don't care about Jules' grooming habits. I really don't. It's a close shave. It always is. Oh my God. Speaking uh, speaking of later on in this arc about uh, facial hair, uh, Reverend Trask, Reverend Gregory Trask. He's not he, in this episode. Like, like Bond. You just made it sound like he's introducing himself like Bond, Trask, Reverend Gregory Trask. Well, I introduced him like Bond. Um, <laughs> I know he's not in this episode, but I like the fact that also, too, Lewis Edmonds, even though he's not in this episode, he gets some wicked looking facial hair in his heart, too. That insane mustache. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I think the only person who never gets face who well one of the only people who never gets facial hair is Jonathan Fred, either as Barnabas or Bramwell. He never gets facial hair. And I love it. He doesn't. He doesn't go the full Clarice Blackburn. <laughs> What's he guys' his favorite scene in this episode? Wow. Uh, I, you know, as much as I love Quentin, uh, the Xandor Magda stuff really at the beginning, I think sets a a really good um, point of connection between the audience who are ultimately, you know, in the eyes of the Collinses, I'm sure would be commoners uh, with um, with with the. the others, I, I think. I think just that kind of connection is um, important and entertaining. And instead of you know seeing the, if we, if we look at how the the pilot goes, you know, we really, even though we see Vicky on the train, it's really Roger and Elizabeth, you know, fretting about how this new person's going to integrate into the house and so on and so forth, and. And here it's very much the opposite. It's you know how are they going to, how are they going to deal with uh, with with you know these these Collinses and and sort of get away? How are they going to stay as long as possible? And that's what we in the audience are asking. How are we going to stay as long as possible with these people? Yeah, and there's a, there's a yeah, there's a real like sparkle. To their conversation, you know, because you could tell that Sandor and Magda have been together a while. I mean, I don't know if they're if they're married or just. Um, and you can you kind of get the sense that maybe you know we talked last time about how um, maybe there was some big, big Virginia Wolf stuff going in episode ten seventy with with Sam and Grayson. I'm wondering oh, if this. At 1070. I wonder if this episode he was writing that mostly like, oh, okay, well, great. Yeah, Grace and I were having some nice little casual conversation, so I'll just use that in the script. Oh, I think this is totally Sam and Grayson and and their inner lives, and more power to them. I love that. 
I love the small interaction we get with Xandor and Quentin because we what are we told about we're we're given hints about Quentin leading up to eighteen ninety seven that he's into the occult. And hey, gypsies are uh, well, so are they. Uh you have uh Magda who has a crystal ball and can see through it. So I love that little again, it's such a little thing, but it's so good that they have it in that in that opening eighteen ninety seven episode. And, you know, a lot of that's going to come into play later with what we know. Um, you know, we, we learn about Jenny eventually. We learn that Beth has been taking care of her. Beth's had a lot of responsibility put on her plate with, Je- with Jenny, Quentin's wife. Um, what a position that is to be, to be the lover of this guy. And then he goes running off with somebody else's wife. And then you're stuck taking care of the ex. I mean, God, no wonder she's trying to kill herself. All right. This is what a, what a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to put on somebody. Quentin Collins, ladies and gentlemen. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where does Quentin feel bad? No, because there's too much bad to feel. Yeah, that, that, yeah, the Collins family in 1897 is not, you know, he's got a grandmother who's dying, who knows the secret. Um, you know, his brother is kind of a, you know, kind of a little bit more of a bastard who will eventually become a monster hunter. You got Judith, you got a, bro- a brother who is a practical jokester and maybe not all, you know, a little bit mad cow. Um He's had um, a wife. He's had a wife who's gone, who has issues. He 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 heads off with Edward's wife, who happens to be a phoenix. He's like kind of half flirting, half putting down this maid. I mean, this is Quentin Collins is the scapegoat of the Collins family at this timeline because he's acting out. But I think it's because everything has been put. It wouldn't surprise me if there was in, in the backstory, it was like he was the one who got blamed for everything. You know, Edward's the responsible one. Um, Carl is the lovable goofball and Quentin's a lost child. Quentin's like, hey, I don't care. You know, sure, I'm going to drink. I'm going to spend money because why not? Yeah, I, it, it couldn't have been a fun childhood because I do we really know the birth order here? I guess. Edith or Judith is the eldest. And then I assume Quentin, I assume it's Edward and then Quentin and then Carl. Yeah, I believe so. Because that that does, I think, matter a little bit in explaining this. I often wondered if uh, Quentin and uh, Carl were twins. Uh just because, you know, Carl getting away there. I think Carl probably had to be the youngest and just indulged unbelievably. Can I give you a little theory about uh, Carl? Sure. Is this going to involve body grooming? No. Is this a, a, Jewel, is it a hot take? It involves a, a, an actual comedian. I sort of think Carl is somewhat taken from Jerry Lewis of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Well, they are plumbing the classics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, I think it's episode 725 where, where Carl does a routine reminiscent of a sequence in Cinder fell up. So you may not be off. Oh, Great. <laughs> Mark Lewis, go to Collinwood. Uh no, but, actually, uh, MDA telephone Jerry Lewis goes to Collinwood. You know, he's yeah. he's smoking cigarettes. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, Fred, you're doing great stuff. You're doing you're good stuff. You're doing good stuff. You know, it's let's take the cameras. Let's do something so artistic. Uh, Louis, when you, when you walk down to, to the to the to, to the stairs on that first stair trip and fall down and do somersaults. Percocet crazed. I see. I like Jerry towards the end of the telethon, where he's saying, "I don't care if you people like me." You know, yeah, because then he, I, they, they don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then he breaks into "You'll Never Walk Alone," 
with no irony. He has yet to see the irony of that of that number. And don't forget, in two years, uh, we'll be able to see uh, the day the clown cried. Two years from now? Yeah, I think it was released to 2025. Uh, is that confirmed? <clears throat> I can look. Now, Jewel, do you know about the day the clown cried? No. You're going to be called resident of Day the Clown Cried. Is you're going to it's going to be your new fascination. Well, maybe not, but it'd be fun if it were. Uh, the Day the Clown Cried is really one of the most infamous uh, b- bad movies uh, never seen, or seen by very few people to the point that some people didn't think it even existed. And you can you can find not only can you find clips on YouTube, but um, I've opened up an article. The, um, the Data Clown Cried was was donated to the Library of Congress, an incomplete copy. Uh, there's one provision. The film was not to be screened on any date earlier than June 2024. Uh, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna get it. I mean, this is this jewel for me is one of the holy grails of of bad movies. Uh, and I haven't even seen it, and and the concept is so horrible. Uh, so Jerry plays a, a clown in Nazi Germany who is inexplicably hired by the Nazis to entertain kids while they were on their way to the gas chambers. Yes. Yes. And you can find clips on YouTube. We're, we're not making this up. Damn. Damn. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, I, I, it's a rare thing for me to say. I wish I were making it up uh, just because I, I feel vaguely uncomfortable living in a world where the day the clown cried exists. It's a, it's a really perverse notion for a movie. And, you know, I mean, I, I look at sallow and Serbian films, feel good movies. You know, so this is this is me saying that. Oh wow, that's. I guess I would ask, why would you do a movie sort of that, like that? You have to be a sociopath. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jerry's Jerry's incredible lack of taste is, uh, you know, he is the complete filmmaker, which was the name of his book. Oh wow! Yeah. Or a total filmmaker. A jury was a true auteur. I mean, he, you know, he was. I mean, he invented video assist. Uh, he, J- Jerry, I mean, I, it, it, what a riddle that guy was. I mean, he really was in, in terms of just trying to figure out where his head was. He was a very intelligent man. You know, and a, and a very capable filmmaker, and then he turns around and does does that. Uh, you got me. Yeah, but he's no Henry Kaplan. He is no Henry Kaplan. That's true. That's true. Although thinking about it, you know, in in considering the idea of the caddy, what sort of caddy would Jerry Lewis's caddy have been for Dan Curtis? Verbally abused. Oh, God. That doesn't even begin to cover it. I, I yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Dan probably could have kept Jerry in line. Yeah, especially um, with those big teeth. <laughs> I just remember. Uh, I remember in history class. Our fifth grade, my fifth, before our fifth grade history teacher, he showed us a video of the the soldiers who found the the concentration camps, and there uh-huh. was a doctor talking about how he couldn't tell. It was so hard to tell the difference between the living and the dead because they were so like the bodies were so frail. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Just insane, uh, but yeah, that's that's so. Great. The joy of eighteen ninety seven. 
Oh mm-hmm. God! Did did little smiley faces just come up? Yes, that that was me. Oh, that was you. <laughs> yeah, I, I I needed to break up because because we were we and and actually there were smiley faces doing this applauding because <laughs> I, I needed to you know we were we were going down the dark path and and we needed we needed a break. So I appreciate it, and not one with Nell Carter and Dolph Sweet. Oh, God, why did you have to bring that up? Uh, the erotic is my business. <laughs> let me let me just say this about the knife configuration, Patrick. The uh-huh. the uh, the gentlemen, all those gentlemen in the bar, uh, they had that ass kick in the coming, did? Uh, yes, I don't think that there's anyone in the audience who has any sympathy for those blackguards whatsoever. <laughs> It's a hell of a bar fight. I mean, yeah. you got to it. Yeah. And it's over very quickly. Yes. yes. Stacy Keach is a hell of an actor. I mean. Well, okay. So here's one of the great, I mean, this won't mean anything to you because you haven't seen the show, but one day you will and it will. Uh, Stacy Keach was uh, almost uh, the lead on Babylon 5. Oh, wow. Uh, he was he was one of the actors that um, they were looking at to play uh, John Sheridan, who at the time was uh, Captain Stephen Ryder, which uh, is not a thing known by most people. The, the the character Sheridan had a had an earlier name. I've sort of seen some of it. I've seen some other of his movies because I saw some, him. Stacy no, Keach? Yeah, Stacy Keach. I've seen um have you ever seen his uh, USS Indianapolis movie? I haven't, but if it's one of those with the sharks in it, I'm not interested. Uh yeah, it's the, it's, it's it's the only story you're gonna tell about the Indian. What are you gonna talk about? Like, you know, movie night? No. Well, it's... well here's the thing. There's there's a couple of different versions of, of that movie. Like there's the one with Nicolas Cage, um, that has the great white shark in it, which that actually talks about the sinking as well, how how the boat got sunk, obviously. Uh-huh. Um, then there's the one with Stacy Keach in it, which that talks about that too. But it's more, it's a little more accurate than what um, what the one with Nicolas Cage is in. So, I, uh, I I don't know why you would impugn the accuracy of anything that Nicolas Cage would be involved with. Joy, this is what confuses me. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's between the the body grooming and 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 the whole Nicolas Cage thing. This is this this, this I I just I can't. Once again, things have run amok, and uh, you know I'm just glad to be here for it. Yeah, it's. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, you guys are making me laugh. That's not a good thing. Because um, so... when you start to laugh, you get in the mood to hurt people. And keep hurting, and keep hurting, and keep hurting. What's wrong with laughing, Jewel? Now you don't want people to laugh. No, I don't want to laugh. I, I have well, to well, well, speaking of laughing and Stacey Keach, um, if you watch the show Titus, which is, you can actually find it on a playlist on YouTube under Titus Nation. Because yeah. Christopher Titus did a, a, I swear to God, Stacey Keach's Ken Titus as the dad is a dead-on perfect impersonation of my father. Except really? that is ain't, yeah, it's 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 amazing. So, folks, if you want to know a little bit about how I how I got to be this way, just putting it out there. My father is more of a sort of if Hugh Beaumont were a starship captain, which is a it's a reasonable combination. If you if you could have had any Dark Shadows cast member as a Star Trek captain, who would you have had? Cast member play a Starship captain. That's yeah. a that's a. I mean, Craig Slocum, of course. Um, Michael Stroka. Uh, no. Um, I well, I mean, I Frid or Selby obviously could have done a good job. Humbert actually had the movie star kind of looks and so on. I think he would have made a decent Starship captain. Um. You know, because you got to find actors who are in that right age range 
when uh, when they did it. I think this is the sort of thing any Dark Shadows fan, Star Trek fan, thinks about. Uh, you know, this is a logical question. Yeah. Five words. Louis Edmonds is Captain Picard. Uh, Louis would have been a great Captain Picard. I mean, he actually really would have been. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent suggestion. Um, if he, again, Fair David would have been a great captain, obviously. That's that's a no-brainer, but... Actually, I think Fair David would have been a better corrupt admiral, you know? One of those corrupt admirals on Star Trek who's like, oh, hey, we Starfleet should do illegal stuff, and and then the captain has has to like, you know, he could have played the the um, Robert Foxworth role uh, in that in the I think it's Homefront and I forget the other. Yeah. It's a two parter on DS Nine. He could have done that. But, but, it would have been for, great. but for a female captain, obviously, Kathleen Lee Scott, obviously. Uh, yeah, she would have been, she would have been terrific. Um, I really, I it it. It's one of my great wishes that, of course, you know, can't come true because I don't have a time machine. But have they gotten Laura or Catherine and played Dr. Crusher? Yeah. But really, really, really would have, uh, it would have saved that show. That show finally would have gone someplace. What's your, what's you guys' favorite Star Trek cameo? Star Trek, okay, how are we defining cameo? Okay, like. Let's say somebody from the original series cameoed either on a movie or the series. Who's what's your favorite cameo? Star Trek cameo. That's how I'm defining it. Well, there aren't too many cameos from the old series onto the new series. Okay. You know, they're they're they really kind of stayed away from that. Um I think probably the best expression of that would be uh, the Deep Space Nine episode, Trials and Tribulations. Uh, what, well, with Arn Darvin showing back up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I would say Way of the Warrior, for me, where you had Kang and Koloth and, uh, and, and Curly Joe and Kor uh, together again for the very first time. I think that was, uh, that to me was just sort of geek Christmas. I really, I I really liked that. Uh, encounter at Farpoint, uh, the Forest Kelly, you know, Jesus. Yeah, of course, you know, I mean, everybody loves D, and uh, I mean, it didn't, it, it sort of, you know, did beg the question, God, wouldn't it have been great if they had worked him in for more of the episode, but I understand why they didn't because it was important for, you know, this cast and this show to have an identity of its own. But, uh, I, it's a lovely scene and, um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if you're the, as someone who's, we've all watched the original series when, and you know, again, the movies were not that far removed from this series. That's the thing, too. So when you see DeForest Kelly's bones, you know. Sounds very talk, morbid. But... Talk, talk to Data. When, when you see him talk to Data, and he's cutting a promo on Data, it instantly fla- I instantly flash back to the first movie where he's cutting a promo on Captain Kirk. Like, this is a, Joel, you got to explain this verb again, because this is kind of like aloha for you. I don't. I don't entirely know when you say cutting a promo. Okay. What you're. DeForest Kelly. Okay. Defor- when DeForest Kelly's. When Bones is telling uh, Data, you want my Adam scatter over Space Boy? He's, that's cutting a promo. Okay. When Stone Cold Steve Austin tells somebody, I'm going to stomp a mud hole in your ass and walk it dry, that's cutting a promo. So when, yes, yes, see, usually I cut a promo. When when I eat uh, a seven bean burrito from Taco Bell, <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it, and you delivered in every sense. So when that's that's the definition of cutting a promo. When <laughs> it certainly so, when, that's what I mean by the uh, Forest Kelly's bones cutting a promo 
on Dave. He's cutting a promo on him about the the transporter. And you know, when you watch the first movie, what's the Forrest Kelly cutting a promo on Kathy? The basically the transporter and the fact that he's called him out of retirement. It's like, what do you like? No, I don't want to be here. Well, I mean, all Bones has to do is just to hang around the motion picture long enough for Commander Sonak to try to beam over. And uh, and I just imagine him standing there as the guys are walking around with the mops saying, um, so Jim, you know, all these years, I was saying this is why I didn't want to go. Did it ever occur to you to send a shuttle for me? No. Do you think I'd be in a bad mood if you had sent a shuttle for me? No, but you didn't. And so here we are, and guess who's right? I mean, I don't like being right in this sense. Commander Sonak was a nice guy, but uh, now do you believe me? Yeah, the transporter's a murder machine. Well, I mean, it it is. (laughs) I mean, it literally, it literally kills you. And then, and then brings you back as this other version of yourself. I mean, it's it's a it's it's an existential nightmare. Is is there anything you guys want to add about episode seven hundred one? Yeah, the transporter. Is, oh, what? Oh, about this. It's great. You should watch it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's seriously. It's 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 uh, it's one of Dark Shadow's finest moments. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's one of the best arcs of Dark Shadows, if not the best, I might say, of, in 1897. And it's the start of a hell of a journey. Uh, it's in for a lot of twists and turns. Yeah, um, and it's it's a point where the writers and directors and everyone in Dark Shadows is like, yeah, we got this, and it's just um, warp speed ahead to really mix the, the, the metaphors even yeah. more. But 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you're absolutely right with that. And um, uh, I I could focus only on 1887 as a as a historian or whatever it is I am, and and be perfectly happy. And it's it's one of the tough things uh, with the day book uh, because I, you know I just I I I would be more than happy. When you know, I see there's an 1897 episode on to just write about it. You know, it's one of the reasons why 1897 has a disproportionate representation on the show or in the day book is is because it is so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who do you think, out of all the heels we get, we get more. We get Count Potopi. Who's your favorite heel of 1897? Just uh, who? Who do I think is the is the most watchable, or who is who's your favorite? The act. Oh, Count Potopi. Yeah, I mean, there's no question uh, that Count Potopi is sort of the jewel in the crown of the 1897 storyline. Yeah, I'd have to say I, Count Potopi as well. Yeah, the yeah, way they, the way, they write, the way they write Potofe too is this sort of sneaky, doesn't reveal himself right away, shadow esque character. Uh, very very smart. Yeah, I, I you know he's he's just he's a delight. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, is there anything you want to add more about Seven and One before we go? No, Jewel, I don't I don't have anything. Uh what do you want us to watch next? What are we what are we looking at, good sir? Episode fifty. Okay. Episode fifty it is. Didn't we already see that as part of the when we did like episode 100, 150, 200? Didn't we already watch oh. that? Oh, oh wait. I the man has a point. Uh, hold on. Uh, I'm literally going back to my own channel. Oh, God. I mean, I, I yeah, I think I think Gordon is is quite correct on this. Uh, yeah. 
we're all in suspense now. So I'm I'm going back a ways, so you have to forgive me. No, 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 no. Of course we forgive anything. Yeah. Take your time, cut that promo carefully. <laughs> this is this is the excitement of the internet of the future. This is Al Gore's dream right now. I'm looking at the one we did. That was um I don't see episode fifty anywhere that we did it, so well then let's let's do episode fifty then. Julie, you wanna do episode fifty? We'll do episode fifty. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll do episode fifty. Yep. <laughs> Find something like going to traffic school. It's because I'm going back to the beginning, isn't it? No, I'm <laughs> um, in a sense. So episode 50, when do you guys, uh, how's tomorrow for you guys for episode 50? Uh, I'm not doing anything. I'm good. Okay. When do you guys want to do the ninth configuration? Uh, whenever it's convenient for Gordon to watch it. Gordon, I, t- I will give you my guarantee. It's a really good movie. Yeah, I, I saw that it's free on Tubi, so, um. Let's see. Uh, we want to aim for Sunday. Yeah, Sunday's good. Hey, Sunday sounds good to me. Sunday's good. Uh, I love I love the castle setting, by the way, in the movie. Uh, it is great set. I mean, you know, just the whole thing. The the you know, Blatty really he really struck gold with that. Yeah, he did. Uh, Scott Wilson steals that movie um that's so. how he got on the subject gordon yeah. was talking about scott wilson in in the heat of the night and uh and i uh, he's just he's he's a uh, fantastic guy you know scott wilson he was yeah just, i know the name yeah did you see walking dead no i'm not a big walking dead fan uh, neither am i um did you see the right stuff yes i've seen the white the right stuff he's scott crossfield he's the other He's the other white meat. He's the other pilot that is kind of the rival, but a good-natured rival to Chuck Yeager. Mm-hmm. So we'll do the we'll do the ninth configuration Sunday episode fifty tomorrow, guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Uh, links to Gordon Demowski's Amazon page will be in the description box. Links to Dark Shadows Day book audio will be in the description box. You gentlemen have a great night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Good night.